So while we discussed cellulitis erysipelas and necrotizing fasciitis in the previous video, I thought I should also discuss a little bit about gangrene. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at gangrene. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button so you never miss such amazing content every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment to Zambia and beyond. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. So remember that when you talk about gangrene, what we're simply referring to is just death of macroscopic portions of tissue. So if you actually think about it, the word gangrene actually is quite synonymous with the term necrosis. Remember, necrosis is death of cells, which eventually leads, if there are many enough, it leads to death of large portions of the tissue, which you can actually see on your gross anatomy. So remember that gangrene can affect the distal parts of the limb because of arterial occlusion. So mostly the arteries are blocked and there's not enough blood flow that's going to this area, these tissues, the cells begin to die because they're not receiving oxygen, they're not receiving nutrients. And remember that this blockage can arise as a result of thrombi, can result as a result of emboli or sometimes even some vascular diseases such as arteritis. And this type of gangrene which actually affects the tissues that were initially sterile must actually be distinguished from the type of gangrene where you actually have an infection that is actually coming up. So classically what we see in gas gangrene, we'll talk about it at the end of this lecture. But in some cases you may have them coexisting where someone has this type of gangrene which was initially sterile, then it gets this super added infection or sometimes it can even get a specific type of infection that leads to gas gangrene. So remember that once the blood vessel has now been blocked, Tissues are not receiving oxygen, they're not carrying out their waste materials, they're not receiving nutrients, they begin to die. So the gangrenous part is actually going to lack arterial pulsation, so you won't be able to feel any arterial pulsations, there won't be any venous return, the capillary response will be very poor. Then the sensation also will not be there, the warmth will not be there, the function will not be there, it will be lost. So remember the first thing that usually may point you towards this person actually having this gangrene is that the colors may begin to change. So the color of the part that's affected usually changes through a variety of shades according to the circumstance that is there. So initially it may appear pale, and then it becomes dusky gray, then it becomes mottled, then it becomes purplish, until finally it turns into this characteristic type of dark brown, sometimes even greenish black or black appearance. I'll show you a picture in the next slide. Then of course this is caused by the disintegration of hemoglobin and the formation of ion sulfide. That's what actually gives the characteristic color to the gangrenous tissue. Now you do have some types of gangrene. Predominantly, I want you to think of them as three main types. We have what is known as a dry gangrene, we have what is known as wet gangrene, and we have what we know as gas gangrene. So our dry gangrene actually is going to be occurring where the tissues now are drying up, they are desiccating, and this is because there's a gradual cutoff of the blood flow. So there's a gradual slowing of the bloodstream. So this is going to be happening when arteries are occluded. This can be as a result of atheromas that are actually blocking blood vessels, especially if this is an end artery and there's no collateral supply to this area, then that part begins to be gangrenous, the part that's affected. And remember that the part that's affected is going to appear dry, it's going to be wrinkled, it's going to be discolored from the disintegration of hemoglobin and as well as the formation of iron sulfide, and of course it's going to be greasy to touch. That's how you know that this is actually dry gangrene. Then sometimes there may be a super added infection which was what we call wet gangrene, which is going to occur where there's going to be an infection as well as putrefaction that's going to be happening. So the affected part actually may become swollen, it may become discolored, and of course the epidermis may be raised and form these blebs. Sometimes you may get some crepitus that's being there with a specific type of infection, which we refer to as gas gangrene. So this is very common in diabetic foots. Now remember that when this gangrene is forming, there's usually a zone of demarcation which is found between the tissue that is truly viable and the dead or the dying tissue 
because this is where the separation is. You have to know where the demarcation is. Because remember, if you actually go into theater quite early and you actually chop off that part, and if you have chopped it off too early, the, the infection will keep spreading. The gangrene will, will still keep spreading. So you have to wait for it to actually demarcate. So the separation is actually achieved by the development of the layer of granulation tissue, which is going to be forming and demarcating the living part from the dead part. And so if it's in dry gangrene, if the blood supply of the proximal tissue is actually quite adequate, then the final demarcation line is going to be appearing in about a matter of days. And the separation actually happens quite neatly and with actually minimal infection. So we call this separation as... Um, the separation by aseptic ulceration. And of course, if the bone is involved, then you may get complete separation, which takes a bit longer uh, than that of the soft tissue alone. And the stump usually tends to be conical as the bone has a better blood supply than the covering than the skin. Then in the moist type of gangrene, there's going to be this significant infection that's going to be there. There's going to be suppuration that's going to be there that's going to be extending to the normal tissues. So this is going to be causing a final line of demarcation to be actually much more proximal than that of the dry gangrene. So the wet gangrene tends to spread even much more. So we call this the separation by septic ulceration. So that's why dry gangrene must actually be kept dry and aseptic as possible. Keep it as clean as possible and as dry as possible. And that's why every effort actually should be made to convert the moist gangrene to the dry type. So if someone has a wet gangrene, you want to try as much as possible to convert it to a dry type of gangrene so that the dry type can actually demarcate quite well and you can actually amputate the part. So sometimes in gangrene, which is resulting from atheromas or the embolism, the line actually of the final demarcation is actually very slow to form and actually sometimes may not even form. So unless the arterial blood supply to the living tissue is going to be improved, the gangrene will keep spreading to the adjacent tissue and or will actually suddenly appear as this skip areas further up the limb. So you get these areas where you see that there's some patches of um, gangrenous tissue and there's some patches of normal tissue. So remember that this skip area should always be carefully sought out and any black patch that's appearing perhaps on either side of the foot, on the heel, or even the dorsum of the foot, or even the half of the calf. You must actually pick these up quite well, because it means that the obstruction may actually be much more proximal than you think. And the infection may also cause gangrene to actually spread proximally to actually areas of extensive inflammation. And in an attempt to locally amputate in the phase of the vague demarcation, this actually leads to failure and the gangrene actually can even reappear in the skin flaps which is why you have to wait for it to demarcate so here's a picture of what gangrene looks like as you can see here this toe is actually appearing darkish discolored so these are both pictures of dry gangrene i didn't have a picture of wet gangrene unfortunately so you have this gangrenous tissue you have this healthy tissue and you can see that there's this demarcation that's in between the two so what's our treatment so the surgeon is actually going to be concerned with how much of the limb or the digit can actually be saved and this depends on the blood supply proximal to the gangrene so sometimes if this can be improved by radiological surgical interventions then it's done quite well so a good blood supply actually may allow consecutive excision where you can sometimes even just amputate a digit or the distal amputations rather than amputating the whole limb and this can actually uh, avoid a major ablation or even sometimes can save the, the limb of this patient from being amputated but uh, of course this is sometimes difficult to do so sometimes they may just amputate the digits and even sometimes amputation of the whole digit can be averted if the blood supply is corrected some conservative treatment involves keeping the affected part absolutely dry like i said Exposure to air and using a fan sometimes can actually assist in the drying up process and the desiccation process and this can actually relieve the pain. The limb must not be heated and of course local pressure areas such as the skin of the heels or the malleoli must be protected if there are fresh patches of gangrene are not to occur in these uh, places. Then of course padded rings, foam blocks and even air beds can be used as preventive aids to prevent gangrene. Then occasionally lifting off uh, a crust or the removal of a hard or even desiccated skin can actually help with demarcation or releasing pus and relieving the pain in the patient. 
Now we move on to gas gangrene. So ultimately, those that have dry gangrene, we do sometimes even cover them on antibiotics if we want to prevent a superadded infection. If there is an infection, we do cover them on antibiotics. And eventually, once that line of demarcation has formed, you can actually plan for the surgery and go and amputate them. I did a video on amputation. I'll leave it tagged at the end of this video that you can actually check out. Then gas gangrene is where you have this major necrosis that's going to be happening because of certain toxins that are being produced by clostridium perfringens. So this produces alpha toxins and occasionally it can also be caused by other clostridia species. And remember that clostridium is found everywhere in the soil. It can be found as a normal gut flora and usually it's going to be entered the muscle through major trauma. It can be entering through GI surgery. Rarely, it can actually be non-traumatic where it's just spontaneous and is due to colorectal carcinoma or immunosuppression. Clinical features are going to include pain which is out of proportion to the signs. Then of course on the skin, there may be some crepitations when you palpate the skin, this crackling sound like as if someone is walking on leaves. The skin often becomes swollen, dark purple and bullet may sometimes form, sometimes the patient may go into septic shock. Management of this may be divided as medical versus surgical. Of course, your diagnosis is going to be clinical most of the times, but you can do x-rays to look at the part to see if there's any bone involvement, if there's any other features that uh, may suggest other diagnosis. Medical therapy is going to include oxygenation because remember that the organism that actually causes the gas gangrene doesn't like oxygen, doesn't live in an oxygen rich environment. So you want to give them this oxygen. So oxygenation is very important. Intravenous fluid, correction of electrolyte abnormalities. We administer our tetanus toxoid if it's indicated. We administer intravenous antibiotics. So your penicillins plus clindamycin or vancomycin and linozolid plus uh, piperacin, uh, tazobactam, combination or a carbapenem or ceftriaxone and metronidazole. This one is a common combination that we use at the hospital, ceftriaxone and metronidazole. And then of course some analgesia. We do want to pl place them in a hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Remember the bacterium does not like oxygen so that's why we're using this hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We also use hydrogen peroxide for the wound care because once hydrogen peroxide freezes out it actually gives out water and oxygen so that oxygen actually kills off these anaerobes. Then surgical therapy is going to include wound debridement, excision of the dead tissue, and ultimately this patient may need an amputation. I really hope you actually enjoyed this video on gangrene. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. I'll see you tomorrow to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.